Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome everybody to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive and you're going to love my guest today. If you haven't jumped over to the Heal Your Hunger Tribe, I'm just going to mention that now. Uh, jump over there on Facebook. Just type in Heal Your Hunger Tribe and check that out. And if you haven't taken the emotional eating quiz yet on the website, healyourhunger.com, definitely do that because you may not know where you stand. Okay. This is a quiz that tells you whether you're an emotional eater or a food addict. So those are your two, your two assignments to, to join the Heal Your Hunger tribe where we talk about all things emotional eating and then take the quiz and just find out where you are on the spectrum. And then you're going to know a lot better what to do about it. So uh, super excited, as I said, about my guest today. She's amazing. She's a good friend and I just adore her. And she's an awesome husband as well. I've <laughs> met him. So I adore them both. Um, but Dr. Fiona McCulloch uh, is a natural naturopathic doctor and since 2001 has run an urban wellness clinic in Toronto, uh, serving thousands of women with hormonal conditions. Uh, her book is, I'm going to hold it up here, is Eight Steps to Reverse Your PCOS, and it offers her well-researched methods for the natural treatment of polycystic ovaria, ovary syndrome, otherwise known as PCOS, it's PCOS. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you, Trisha. I'm such a huge fan of your work, as you know. Um, so I'm just super excited to be here today. Thanks for inviting me. It's such a pleasure. And this is an important topic because people with PCOS, are they have issues with emotional eating and, and, and weight gain, right? Absolutely. So um, PCOS is now estimated to um, affect, you know, about 10 to 15% of women. Um, and some, some research even shows up to 20%. And the rates of, of eating disorders of various types are extremely high in women with PCOS. Wow. Um, and why is that? Is that because the, their hormones are so whacked? There is, yes, there's a few different reasons for that. They don't 100% know, but um, one of the reasons is that uh, women with PCOS have high levels of testosterone. And uh, particularly in the adolescent years, testosterone causes impulsivity. And impulsivity can cause us to make certain decisions that may not be the oh, best yeah. choices. Oh yeah, <laughs> like like I know yeah. I should have the uh, fruit bowl, but I'd rather have the hot fudge sundae. <laughs> yes, and exactly. So, and then as an adolescent, you know, a lot of these foods are just so available now and so easy, and and a lot of uh, teens, you know, they they enjoy the taste of these. It's very easy to get addicted, um, as you know so well, and teach, mm -hmm. you know, so much about. Um, so that's one element. It's the testosterone, and that continues to cause that same um, center of the brain to be higher drive. And what they found is that <clears throat> in the presence of estrogen when that testosterone is there, it, it's associated with more weight gain. So men have testosterone and they have the same issue. Yeah. However, you know, we know uh, compared to, to, to women, men generally eat more poorly uh, and tend to eat more junk food uh, a lot of the time. And it, it, it does come down to this testosterone, but it's the estrogen in combination that seems to cause weight gain. The second thing is that it's associated with insulin resistance, which uh, is associated with weight gain directly. So women with PCOS secrete higher than normal levels of insulin and insulin causes you to store fat uh, more readily and it blocks fat break, uh, breakdown. So basically you're, you've got that increased drive to eat and a blood sugar roller coaster. And that's kind of how it happens. That's a bad combination. <laughs> Very bad. Yes. And there's so, a lot of wow. disorders too. So an anxiety and depression. So, okay. Um, Cause when your hormones are whacked, you're, you're probably more prone to anxiety, right? And yes. depression. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. It's, so that, it's that, that. And then that leads to comfort eating, obviously trying to anesthetize um, and bring oneself down from either down from the anxiety or bring themselves up from the depression. Um, yeah. Now this is something you personally have dealt with, right? Yes. So PCOS is a, it's a lifelong disorder and uh, I have it myself. I did not know that this was what I had until I was about 30, 31 years old. Uh, but I've had the symptoms uh, my whole entire life. And so I've gone through this myself in various forms over the years. 
Wow. And what were those symptoms you had? For me, um, my symptoms were very classic. So with PCOS, there is typically, uh, you're going to see irregular ovulation in many women, especially younger women. So uh, cycles, my periods would be very far apart, you know, three, four months apart, sometimes six months. Um, and then uh, there are symptoms of too much testosterone. In my case, that was hair loss and acne, so severe cystic acne, which I dealt with for a very long time, probably mm. 15 years of that, um, and weight gain for me, especially around my midsection. And as a teenager, I remember binging on carbs all the time. Wow. And you, yeah. and you can see the correlation. That's incredible. So it sounds like this is one of those conditions that people have to go on a long ride of trying to figure out what the hell's wrong with them before they land on, wow, I have PCOS, let's deal with this. Yes, especially uh, if, because if you, you know, the, the cysts in the ovaries, a lot of, a lot of people are really misled by those. You don't have to have cysts in your ovaries to have PCOS. It's more based on the symptoms. So there's been kind of a, a big problem with missing diagnoses uh, okay. due to that. And then there's also a group of women with PCOS that are not, you know, we, in medical textbooks, women with PCOS are described as much, much more heavy, but there's a lot of women who have it who are very lean or maybe just carry weight around their midsection. So uh, it gets missed a lot. Okay. So, um, so tip, I wasn't thinking, oh yeah, cysts on the ovaries. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of the word. Okay. So, um, I literally just got a text yesterday from my cleaning lady who said she can't come because she has been in the hospital with ovarian cysts. Is that, is that, I mean, that can happen without having PCOS, right? Yes. So most ovarian cysts are not PCOS. Okay. Uh, PCOS, the cysts are actually eggs that didn't ovulate. And so it's like these tiny little cysts in the ovaries. Um, some women with PCOS do ovulate every month, so they may not have cysts and older women tend not to have cysts who have PCOS, okay. um, but those cysts, they can occasionally get very enlarged and twist and then land you in the hospital. So that's more of a, something that you're more at risk for okay. with PCOS, but it's also something that can happen outside of PCOS too. Gotcha. So one doesn't indicate the, the other necessarily. No. Okay. So, and then one doesn't have to have the cyst in order to, uh, you know, be, be diagnosed with, uh, PCOS. Wow. It's, but it does yes. sound tricky, you know, getting to the bottom of it definitely sounds tricky, which just adds to the frustration and probably the, the mental anguish, you know, of what's wrong with my body, what's going on with me. Yes. Yes. It's very common for a lot of women with this condition to feel that, um, their body has betrayed them. It's not functioning in a feminine way, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's functioning outside of where they're comfortable and it's um, because the hormones are all, all, all over the place. It can lead to a feeling of being like out of control in many ways because sure. you're, not you're not necessarily having that regularity that you can depend on and you can't really control it either. Oh my gosh, that's hard. And then the, the um, excess testosterone, does that cause other issues as well? Like aggressive behavior, besides impulsive, is it also like aggressive behavior and other, you know, typical signs of testosterone? It can, yes. Um, it can definitely do that uh, at times. Um, it can also, uh, basically, the, the main issue that happens though is not that it's the testosterone, you know, which is higher, but that in women with this condition, their estrogen tends to go like that a lot. Okay. And so it's like the, the hormones aren't steady. So they're just going up and down. They're irregular and that affects the brain profoundly. As any woman will know who has PMS, that's a stage when your hormones go from here to here. Right. And that causes mood symptoms. And so it's this, that's happening kind of all the time in PCOS. Oh my God, that's awful. <laughs> it's, it's brutal. Yes. It's brutal. I, mean, I know for myself, I have, there's always one day, a couple days before my period where it's like, I need to 
hole up in my, uh, my, my home and not see anybody and not talk to anybody. Cause I have no control over what's going to come out of my mouth. It's, and, and it's, and I'm yes. rage, I'm rageful. I'm I, I, like, something can trigger me and then I am loose lips. Normally I'm like a really nice person and very <laughs> diplomatic, but on that day I yes. can, I am, I, I astonish myself by what comes out of my mouth and the, the quick temper that I have. Yeah, I'm the same. And it's extremely common. Almost all women have that for about one day before their yeah. period. So, so, so what we're talking about is having that, like it, that basically not knowing where you're going to be on any given day throughout your entire cycle. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, and it's all over the place. Like it could be going up and down and all, all around, just nothing that your brain, your brain needs time to adjust to hormonal changes. And so it doesn't get that opportunity. So um, it just regulates a whole bunch of things. And, um, you know, then there's a lot of issues with things like cortisol, like the stress hormones, there's problems with circadian rhythm with PCOS. So a lot of things that can hit that stress axis. Wow. That's the, I, my heart really goes out to people who have that. If, so the things that you're talking about, if some, somebody's listening and might have it, they're going to start saying, wow, that could be me. So what would they do as their next step? So um, what I would suggest to do for most people is actually to get some lab testing done and um, just determine if that's what the condition is. You would probably need to see a, a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor who, or a reproductive endocrinologist who has experience in PCOS because it can be tricky to diagnose, particularly in women over 35 because the levels of testosterone at that age are lower than the reference range um, because testosterone decreases with age in women and yet they can still have PCOS, you know, relative, too much testosterone relative okay. to their other hormones. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's important to go uh, to someone who really understands this condition. And it's, but they've had it, if they have it or they're starting to see symptoms after 35, they didn't develop it just then, they've had it. Is that correct? Yes, they've always had it. Now there are temporary conditions that can look like PCOS. So a lot of the research we know about PCOS now shows us that a lot of it's related to what we call endocrine disruption in that our hormones get messed up at key points in development. That can be either uh, when we're developing as a, a fetus in the womb or during puberty. And as we know, our environment is full of endocrine disruptors. We're taking, uh, you know, birth control pills. Um, there's stuff in our, uh, like, pesticides, herbicides. All of these have endocrine effects. And so, you know, anything that disrupts the hormones can induce a temporary PCOS-like condition. And it will remain temporary if it, that happens at a point that's not during key development. So, say, for example, you go on the birth control pill and you come off. Then women, some women will get PCOS-like symptoms that will resolve or it's treatable and they don't necessarily have PCOS. But say that event happened during puberty, that woman could get PCOS and, or if it happened in the womb. And we have a lot of evidence that we, we, sh we can show that you can induce PCOS in a baby animal by exposing it to one, uh, just one time to bisphenol A, which is a, a plastic. Uh, and that actually lasts for two generations. So the baby rat that's developing one exposure to bisphenol A, that baby rat will have PCOS and then its babies have PCOS too. Get out. And that, yes. is that a big a known cause of PCOS then? It's thought to be one of the major causes, endocrine disruption in utero. And um, also high levels of testosterone in utero can also cause the baby to have PCOS. So women with PCOS are more likely to have babies with PCOS too. Wow. And this, this plastic, particular plastic, where is that? Is that like in regular water bottles or, yes. or baby bottles? Yeah. So in Canada, they've now banned it from baby bottles. I, I can't remember about the U.S. There's a big movement against bisphenol A, but now they're replacing it with other bisphenols that are probably the same. Oh, this is the, B <laughs> this is the, the BPA, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they are. I think they've banned it here or maybe, or maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's just a lot of like at Whole Foods, it says non BPA or whatever. Non -BPA. Maybe it's not a, a mandate. 
Yeah, so there's BPA is one of the more like famous endocrine disruptors in that it's had a lot of studies done on it, but there's also a lot of other ones that are still, you know, they're not banned. We're still eating eating these things. So basically, uh, you know, plastics, uh, that's definitely a big one. So just avoid, you know, plastic, anything, especially if you're going to heat it up, definitely avoid that, you know, don't heat plastic, please. And pregnant women should be much more careful and teenage girls, uh, especially age, um, you know, even preteen. So age like 10 to 16, that age group is more susceptible. So they should be more careful. Um, But then, um, you know, there's definitely like pesticides that have many estrogen like effects or impacts. Um, So going with organic foods, looking at um, the organic, uh, the shopper's guide to look, uh, to see which foods are the most heavily sprayed and choosing those as organic. So, you know, these are, these are definitely things that we can do to reduce. Um, also cosmetics can tend to have, uh, endocrine disruptors in them, uh, um, shampoos, beauty products. Uh, so they're everywhere. You can't avoid all of it, but right. you can, you know, it's, it's good to but try. that makes, yeah, that makes a really good case for being super conscious about the products that you're using, you know, detergents and shampoos and soaps and, you know, and, and chemicals, pesticides. I mean, it's so, so important, you know, and I hope everybody listening will take heed and, and see it's not just a, a fad, like we have to clean you know, eat as clean and be as conscious as possible about using clean products. It's really, it's serious. And this is probably one of many, you know, uh, ailments that can happen on account of that stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's just so, um, you know, it's so rampant now. And what they find is our fat cells actually store these endocrine disruptors and slowly leach them out into our bodies. And they found that women with PCOS have higher levels of BPA in their blood than other women. Um, and there is a reason uh, for that in that their fat cells store more, Yeah, you know, in general, um, because there is fat cell dysfunction and over storage of fat and PCOS as well. So it's quite a, a, like alarming, but also empowering because if, you know, especially if you're, if you're thinking of having children, you can really impact future generations by making some changes. That's great. So let's talk about some of those changes. What do you recommend? So um, when it comes to uh, looking at, at, you know, endocrine disruption, you know, we would definitely want, want to, you know, go organic, eat as many, you know, real whole foods as possible, avoid things in boxes, when, you know, as much as you can. Um, organic uh, cosmetics, especially anything you leave on your skin and don't wash off. Um, that's very important. Um, one of my favorites is RMS Beauty for makeup. I love their makeup and it's all natural and it's really nice uh, quality. Um, so that's, uh, that's an option, but there's a lot. So there's just so many options now for these. Um, yeah. Organic hair care products are, are really helpful, you know, as well. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, some of the elements of PCOS that would affect emotional eating, that's a little more complicated, but my strategies, I think are very similar to yours in that we tend to, uh, look at keeping the blood sugar very stable and leaving spaces of time between eating. So creating structured meals that are really stabilizing to the blood sugar with healthy fats, proteins, lots of vegetables and certain amounts of, for PCOS women do tend to be more sensitive to high carb diets. So we tend to control the carbs, but not go low carb. So that sort of diet is very stabilizing to the blood sugar, getting really good sleep. And um, for a lot of women with PCOS, their melatonin levels are low. um, And melatonin has been shown to be helpful in this condition. So sleep is really, really key. Um, And then of course, stress reduction is super important. Um, in all areas. So uh, anytime women can do something like meditation, yoga, prayer, something that really feeds the soul, um, resets the stress axis, those, those are, that's just so key. 
You're singing my song, my friend. <laughs> so I, I've coined the phrase three meal magic. And that's totally what helps emotional eaters because, you know, if we're on the grazing plan, you know, all day long, we're put and it's always, you know, if we're snacking, yeah. it's not on lettuce. Okay. So it's, it's so good to have structured meals and space between yeah. the meals, just like you're talking about. And for cravings as well. You know, if you have actually a good, healthy meal, you're going to crave less, you know, in between between meals and you're going to be able to oh. get to the next meal and then you're just eating you're making healthier choices all the way around it's so so true and if you think about it too every time you eat even if it's a snack your insulin goes up so you be, if you want to become insulin sens sensitive uh, you have to let your insulin go down so letting that leaving that space between the meals that's a much more natural way of eating we're not really meant to be just eating all the time um, it's just not you know you know, we've, we've got things to do. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's something that we've just become accustomed to in our society, but it's not really a natural kind of. It's so yeah. true. Our, our bodies weren't meant for that. It's overloading, it's taxing and, and it's, you know, it ends up in, in addictive eating basically, you know, it's like, I don't know what to do with myself if I'm not constantly munching on something. So yeah, that's powerful. And I love what you talked about the meditation and the prayer and the things to reduce stress. These are all so key for overcoming emotional eating because, you know, emotional eating is we're eating over our emotions. We're eating because we're stressed. We're basically stress eating. And so we've got to have a better way to deal with our stress and setting up our day, you know, with that connection, you know, with spirit and with that, you know, really that grounding effect of meditation and writing and reading. So, so important. So I just love, I love that that's part of your solution, Fiona. That's fantastic. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, um, uh, very few women who, uh, with PCOS, I test most people's cortisol levels, but very few have normal cortisol patterns. Um, so I, I think it's extremely important because cortisol is a, a hormone that's responsible for 20% of protein production in our body. So if you have like stress access issues, or you're constantly going into flight or fight, or you're eating to make yourself feel better, or calmer, every time that's happening, your cortisol goes up. And that causes a lot of things to start going wrong in your body. So the, the traffic lights stop working at the right time, basically. So, um, so it is, I, I view it as is it's as important as, as diet. Amen. God, this is great stuff. Well, um, you have a gift to give people that can help them start identifying this, I believe. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So I have a couple of things that if you're interested, you might find useful. I have a quiz. It's at drfionand.com. This okay. goes through the eight different factors that are important for women with PCOS. So you can learn if you have insulin resistance or inflammation or, um, hormone issues or thyroid issues with this quiz. So it tells you about your type of PCOS because all women are a little bit different with what's going on there. So um, that would probably be one of the gifts I think people would be most interested in. Um, I do also have a handout uh, on the food insulin demand and it shows you how certain foods impact our levels of insulin that we eat. And so when we're looking at keeping our blood sugar stable, um, it's better not to eat, you know, the foods that are extremely spiking to insulin. So it's just a resource people might find interesting. If they're That's awesome. And we'll put those links right uh, below in the show notes um, on uh, healyourhunger.com. So that's great. Thank you so much for that, Fiona. That's really generous. That sounds like really helpful tools for people um, to really identify and then start healing, uh, PCOS. So I have one parting question for you that I ask all my guests and that is what is your deepest hunger? Hmm. That is a very good question. <laughs> I don't mean to stump you, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> my deepest hunger at this moment in time, my deepest hunger would be for uh, a few days at the beach with a book. Oh, that's a good, that is a good one. That sounds really nice. It's been snowing every day oh, and it's, it's been ice storms every day up here. So, but yeah. I am going to Florida on Saturday. So, I oh, hooray for that. Come true. Yeah. Yeah. And the weather's <laughs> great in Florida. I just checked the weather because I'm headed there next week. So, oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, that's cool. good. I haven't checked it. So, 
Nice. Good for you. Well, I, well, I, I'm looking forward to, you ha- to your having your hunger healed very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for this fantastic information. Very useful, very actionable. And for everybody uh, listening, please check out her resources and uh, information in her book, Eight Steps to Reverse Your PCOS. And also make sure to join the Heal Your Hunger Tribe on Facebook. So Fiona, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Trisha. It was so wonderful to be on your show. Great to have you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.